Well, hello, Nativity Bible Heads. It is Dr. Wayne, and it is time for Sunday Morning Power Bible Study. We are into the uh, sixth Sunday after the Epiphany, and um, uh, February 13th. And um, here uh, we're getting into some uh, wisdom uh, writings, some wisdom literature. Our, um, our gospel passage is, is going to be um, uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Plain, not Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain uh, that we have in Luke chapter 6. Um, Paul's got some uh, more words about the, uh, the resurrection in um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then there's also Psalm 1 and also um, a bit from uh, Jeremiah 17. We're going to start with Jeremiah 17 <clears throat> and uh, go to the psalm and then the uh, epistle and the gospel in that order. Uh, in Jeremiah 17, okay, our passage today um, is uh, from this uh, portion of the book where, uh, so, so, okay, Jeremiah is a, we, we, we know, we're familiar with Jeremiah. We had his call experience a couple of weeks ago. Um, he was a prophet who was asked to give people a very unpopular message, um, this section that we have in uh, chapter 17, uh, verses uh, seven, uh, no, well, no, five through um, 10 is very odd. Um, uh, it, it reads like, uh, uh, like a wisdom psalm or a proverb type thing. Listen to this. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Okay, so that's verses five and six. So, um, uh, remember, it starts out, uh, Jeremiah's audience is Judah, and this is all on the heels, of, not on the heels of, but just like the headwinds are blowing, if you will, with regard to their military takeover. He's already said, this is going to happen, uh, you're going to be exiled. Everything's, you're going to lose everything. Um, it's not going to be pretty, uh, but it is something that these are circumstances that we brought on ourselves, this kind of thing, okay? So in that context, these words come across as um, advice for identifying who's really paying attention, okay? Um, cursed are those who trust in mere mortals, uh, who make mere flesh their strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Um, this has already been clearly established because that's what the judgment that he's saying is coming is, is all about. They should be like a shrub in the desert. They shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places in the wilderness in, not, in an uninhab uninhabited salt land. So, um, Frequently, <clears throat> when, you, when you live in a, 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 a land where water is at a premium, well, we can appreciate that, right, uh, in, in Arizona, um, anything that, any description of a plant that isn't getting water uh, or just, you know, uninhabited salt land, okay, uh, you know, if you've ever seen the, the great salt flats, you know, you know what I'm talking about, no water there, um, Water is seen as a uh, sign of life, right? Yeah, that's one of the things that, uh, uh, that we get all excited about when we look for uh, life on other planets is, uh, oh, is there water there? If there's water, there's life, you know? Um, even if it's frozen water, uh, that kind of thing. Um, uh, the, uh, th so it, it reads a lot like what we find in the Psalms. You're gonna see this when we get to Psalm 1 next. And now, in verse seven, it sounds like a beatitude. 
Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. And this is the Tetragrammaton, the capital, all caps, L-O-R-D, which means it's uh, the, the English translation of the Hebrew covenantal name for God, Yahweh, the Y-H-W-H, the yod Hey vav Hey. And so when we see this, uh, we know that he is referring not just to, you know, the, not, not the word, the generic word Lord, but the, the covenant name for the Lord. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. Blessed are they, right? They shall be, oh, like a tree planted by water. Okay. Sending out its root, roots by the stream. Um, uh, in um, uh, Ezekiel and also in the book of Revelation, we have pictures there of these... Um, uh, paintings of what it's like to be um, forever nourished by God. And, and the, the picture, it's painted of, of, of trees that are always near a source of water and always able to get water, 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 so they can grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, the, the New Jerusalem uh, is pictured like this in, in the book of Revelation. Uh, trees, they shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots, by the stream, it shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. Yes, this is pointing out to the fact that we don't have to worry about getting wilted, okay? Apparently, this is an idyllic picture as well, because even in, um, uh, well, we know that some trees, the deciduous trees, they don't always stay green. It's just about, not, not about water, it's all about the season, right? Um, there are some trees that do stay green all the time. So maybe that's the kind of trees that I have in mind. I don't know. Um, but uh, do you see the contrast between the shrub uh, in the desert that, uh, that uh, you know, lives in the parched places in the wilderness and the salt lands and all that versus this, right? In the year of drought, it is not anxious and it does not cease to bear fruit. Oh, this is another uh, 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 motif that we find in um, uh, uh, apocalyptic literature, in uh, literature that um, speaks of the, the ideal, the, the ideal uh, time of, uh, of, of, if you're always bearing fruit. Remember the, um, the creation story where um, in, on a certain day God creates uh, the vegetation and each each tree bearing its fruit and the, the seed that is in it and all of that. These are motifs of creation that also get projected into uh, motifs of of uh, of um, the uh, end times of the way things will be forever in the realm of God, uh, especially for God's people. The idea that you will never cease to bear fruit, okay? Um, so do you get the contrast here? The shrubs versus the trees that are by the water bearing fruit. Um, and then we have two more verses here, the verses nine and 10. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? The Lord, I, ah, yeah, I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. Again, this is a highly unusual uh, kind of uh, wisdom saying uh, found in the midst of a book of prophecy. Um, the, um, this thing at the, uh, at, at the end in verses nine to 10, um, uh, we, we know that God discerns hidden motives and he treats uh, human uh, impartiality. He treats humans impartially. But the, 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 the emphasis here is on the difference between the a holy God and the creation that always will fail God, okay? The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand? Anytime we have that word, the heart, by the way, uh, the word heart um, 
uh, isn't always the word heart. Um, it's the seat of emotions. The, the word is the, the, uh, the, the actual word for it is kidney. Can you believe that? Um, the, seat, the seat of the emotions, uh, that's the way it was. Uh, we, we translated it as heart because that's what it is for us. The idea of the seat of the emotions. It's like our emotions, they're going to, you know, um, they're going to fail us, okay? They're going to fail us. Um, the Lord tests the mind, searches the heart. It, to te- the mind, actually, the word for mind um, <laughs> is weird, literally is the word heart. The, and he searches the heart, searches the kidney. So the mind is that uh, the, the word heart for them was that place for uh, where um, uh, decisions are made, where individual uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, choices are, are, are discerned. Um, for us, that's the mind. So we translate heart as mind and we translate kidneys as heart. That's the way that goes. A little trivia there for you. Um, so uh, again, that's the end of our reading, verses five through 10, but it reeks of wisdom writings. And we're gonna see that um, uh, in, our, our, our Psalm, in our Psalm 1 writing. So I want to uh, make a connection though before I move on <clears throat> about this. This is the season of epiphany, okay? Epiphany is what? It's about manifestation of God, about God showing God's self, about divinity, you know, producing fruit to, to be seen. Well, the emphasis uh, this week in the kinds of writings and the tri- types of words that we have is that God's epiphany happens when God's people are aware of what God is asking them to do, and they actually take heed and make wise choices, okay? So the wisdom writings, uh, the wisdom uh, uh, literature that we have is emphasizing uh, this aspect of, of epiphany, that we can be manifestations of God. We can be that when we practice good choices and making good choices. Look at this in uh, Psalm chapter one. Happy are those, okay, I'm gonna read it in the, I'm gonna read it in the, um, uh, the uh, Book of Common Prayer version because that's how we get it in, um, in our worship. And I like the translation of it in the uh, Book of Common Prayer because it makes it, um, uh, it gets, gives us a better sense of the, the meter. Um, remember, this is all poetry in the Psalms. Uh, poetry doesn't mean it rhymes. Po- poetry means it has a certain meter, a certain number of beats to it. It's more like a more like a rap music kind of a thing, where it's like it has to do with hitting beats with uh, with certain syllables at certain times that uh, that create a feel and a gong 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 that kind of a thing. It doesn't have anything to do with well, once there was a girl from Nantucket. No, it's nothing like that. Okay, um, verse. One, happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. So do you see this, how it's already discerning, it's proclaiming judgments on, and who's good and bad with regard to the choices they make, okay? Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night. Delight in the law of the Lord, okay? Remember the word law is Torah, teaching, instruction, okay? Um, Their delight is in the the instruction and they meditate on his law. The word meditate is literally recite, okay? That's the reason why even today you will find uh, at the Wailing Wall, you'll find many very pious Jews uh, uh, reading out loud um, the, the Torah, okay? Um, that's their idea of uh, putting uh, this into practice to say that they meditate on it. it. Literally says recite, okay? And that's the reason why you will, actually you can, you can hear them doing that. You can hear them and they'll be doing this kind of a thing. That's why they're doing it because that's what it says you do. Mm-hmm. So that's how you delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on his law day and night. Verse three, they are like, oh, get this theme, trees planted by streams of water 
bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither, everything they do shall prosper. Very, we just heard this in Jeremiah, did we not? Yes. So um, this, like again, I said before, idyllic pictures of uh, ideal sustenance is that of being a tree near a source of water and always being able to draw from it and always, you know, leaves that don't weather. Oh, yes, of course. Bearing fruit. Oh, yes, in due season. Um, of course. Oh, verse 4. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. So this is an interesting um, uh, picture if you think about it, the, the, the imagery of the, um, uh, of the vertical imagery, if you will, of the, um, uh, the righteous. And now, and then we talk about the wicked, you know, like the chaff, which the wind blows away. Chaff, when the wind blows away, right? And what's the, the picture of the righteous? Okay, yeah, exactly. The, uh, the vertical things that stick straight up. Um, uh, you can see the contrast, can you not, between what they are distinguishing with the, um, uh, the good people and the bad people. Uh, verse 5, oh, um, therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes. Yeah, well, yeah, they're not trees planted by water, right? right? They're chaff nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. Okay, so if you put that with regard to, you know, the, 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 the Psalm and the Old Testament lesson frequently um, carry the, the same theme more uh, contiguously, if you will, uh, than, uh, than, the, than the rest of our Lections, um, wisdom sayings, um, identifying clearly who's who's on the right and who's not. Um, this book, um, this book. When I say this, this psalm is the lead psalm in the canonical collection of our psalms, as kind of a preamble, if you will. Um, it lays the foundation of what is it that defines a person whose heart is after God. The, the whole book of Psalms moves from this through, you know, all kinds of things, you know, personal laments and um, uh, hymns of ascent and um, supplications, thanksgivings, uh, it ends in pure praise, okay, in the book of Psalms. So um, if you look at the book of Psalms from beginning to end, you can see how the, this, this is put here as a, uh, a frontispiece, if you will, of um, defining who it is that actually has a heart for God. And the result at the very end is nothing but pure praise, which is uh, the result of somebody who is um, delighting in the law of the Lord and meditating on his law day and night. Okay, I'm moving on now. Let's move on. We're gonna move on to um, uh, Paul Wright is writing in 1 Corinthians. Now, we've had uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had the love chapter, and then um, uh, last week, we had um, uh, the beginning of chapter 15, uh, which um, uh, was Paul's uh, talking about his epiphany that came via the, hand, the tradition that had been handed down. Now he's going to get even more into the weeds with regard to resurrection, okay? Um, these passages, these sections are typically uh, something that we read during um, uh, Easter tide uh, in the post-resurrection time. Um, uh, but here, uh, let's look for an epiphany theme in it, shall we? Verses 12 through 20 of 1 Corinthians 15. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, which he is, uh, he just got done establishing that, 
How can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Okay, one of the things we gotta keep in mind is that, okay, Paul's talking to a church in Corinth. In the Greek mind, uh, there were um, schools of thought that held that, the, okay, the soul is this sacred thing uh, uh, that's, of, that's, that's divine, but it's being imprisoned or it's being trapped in this terrible body. <laughs> body, oh, bodies are bad, bodies are horrible. And it's uh, believed that the, 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 the belief, faith, the, the idea that there is no resurrection of the dead, meaning the idea that the body, why would you want the body to come back to life? The, the body is a prison. The body is a jail. The body is something which, which keeps that, that pure wonderfulness uh, from, uh, it's, it's, it's like, a, like, like an imprison, like a literal prison. Now, that's the root of why people would say, oh, there is no such thing as resurrection of the dead. Because why, why would you want the body to come back? Okay, this is the what's at the heart of this, what you might call the, those people would say that there's no resurrection of the dead. If there is no resurrection of the dead, he says in verse 13, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. The word for vain there is like the word empty, okay? <clears throat> If Christ has not been raised. So uh, Paul basically uses the, uh, the uh, I don't know if I would necessarily make the argument the same way. Um, if there is no resurrection, then Christ has been, not been raised. Well, I don't know if I would say it like that. I would say because Christ has been raised, there, that's how we know there is resurrection. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't go that direction. <clears throat> oh, by the way, um, you know, one of the earliest um, uh, Christological controversies in the early church <clears throat> had to do with this belief that some people believe that Jesus wasn't entirely human um, because this belief that was out there that, oh, to have a body, having a body was bad. It was bad. And um, because of what, the, what I just told you about the, those popular, uh, that kind of a popular theology. And so therefore, Christ's um, uh, appearance among us wasn't uh, actually as a real body like the body that we have. It was something else. And so um, they think, the, the, one of the early Christological controversies is that, well, he didn't have, it just seemed like I had a body. Um, it didn't, it looked like a body, but it couldn't have been actually a body because bodies are bad, right? This is one of the reasons why our Nicene Creed is what it is, okay? Our Nicene Creed is very much trying to establish that this Christ, this Jesus that we see, that he's true God from true God, begotten, not made, begotten, okay, begotten, like we're begotten. So um, the idea is that um, it's combating uh, those uh, thoughts uh, and um, uh, ideas that he, what, he couldn't, he didn't really have a body, it just, just looked like it to us. And they thought that that was more honoring uh, to their thoughts of Christ uh, than, uh, than not, okay? So, FYI, uh, that was a part of the early church in its, uh, uh, one of the early um, uh, heresies, okay? If, and if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. So um, Paul is really saying like, okay, well, if you're gonna go that direction, do you realize the implications? Uh, the implications are horrible, okay? If there isn't a resurrection of the dead, then Christ hasn't been raised, then our proclamation has been stupid and our faith has been stupid, okay? Um, uh, in Earlier in chapter 15, he talked about how he had received 
uh, the, the testimony from those who had uh, seen the Lord. He testifies to having a vision, um, no, a vision of a, a meeting with the risen Lord, if you will, um, and, uh, uh, and that he, you know, he appeared to more than 500. That for Paul, the, uh, the manifestation of who God is in the resurrected Christ was attested to by many, many witnesses. And for Paul, uh, his ex experience as well um, confirms it. And so uh, he's like, you know, if this didn't happen, then boy, we are in bad, bad shape, okay? Here he goes on in verse 15. We are even found to be misrepresenting God. He's saying that, you know, if, if, there is no, if Christ isn't really resurrected because there's no resurrection of the dead, we'd be misrepresenting God. We're telling a lie, basically, about who God is. Because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. He said that before, right? If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Boy, that really comes down to it. So when we comes to saying that Jesus Christ died for our sins, for Paul, he's saying, he didn't just die for us, he was raised also. That's what actually makes uh, create, that's, that, that's what seals the deal with regard to, uh, you know, uh, having an effect on our, you know, on, 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 our, on our sins. That he was, that he died for sins and he was raised. If he had not been raised, then uh, the death would have meant nothing. Would have meant nothing. Then those who also have died in Christ have perished. So Paul goes on to say then that it's like, so you realize that um, all, all, all your loved ones that we've, that we're saying that, like, oh, because there's resurrection of the dead and, um, and Christ was raised and uh, you know that family that you died that we've been saying that, oh, well, you'll get to see them again because they'll be raised and you'll be raised. Guess what? That's not gonna happen. So he's tr really trying to bring it down to him like, boy, the, are you sure you're willing to go there? Because I, what's the payoff exactly, okay? Verse 19, if for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Yeah, he really brings it down to like the worst. Like we, if, if, if that's not the case, if we got this wrong, folks, um, we are really in a heap of trouble, okay? And then verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. Yeah, first fruits um, um, in a harvest type of an economy and that in an agrarian world, the first fruits are the promise of what is to come. The first fruits are the like, oh, ooh, this like that, that, that portion of it that tells you that, oh, it's even better, even more is coming, but this is the promise that it's happening. This is the promise that is happening because of the first fruits. That's the way he pictures the resurrection of Christ as that thing that guarantees for us that, oh, it's happening. Okay, it's happening. Um, first fruits are there. Boom. How does this have to do anything with epiphany? Well, if you think about um, the way Christ is manifested in the world, Christ is manifested through us, and if we aren't exemplifying uh, hope, Okay, the resurrection is what gives us hope. The resurrection is what gives us faith. The resurrection is what gives us uh, confidence in, in the whole game of transformation, right? Well, uh, that's not gonna happen if Christ hadn't been raised. 
we have access to that. We are the ones showing what God is about by the way we conduct our lives, by the way we exude hope, by the way we have faith. The resurrection means that um, we don't have to be obsessed with the way we fear, with fearing death. Um, people make a lot of strange choices around fearing death. Well, we don't have to make those choices because we don't have to fear death because of the resurrection that is promised. So this is a way uh, that, this, this has deep impacts, wide ranging impacts on the way we can live our lives in, uh, uh, in the world uh, based on the fact that we have this hope and this solid basis of, uh, yes, Christ was raised, resurrection, it is something that uh, comes, uh, uh, it, 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 it has an effect on our entire being, in our conversations, and the way we act, the way we think, the way we treat other people, the way we let other people treat us, all of the above. Okay, last but not least is our gospel passage. Our gospel passage is from Luke chapter six. Now, um, I think last week we talked about the miraculous catch of fish, uh, the church of the multiplication. Or the, I'm thinking about that because that's where I'm gonna do a homily on my uh, uh, pilgrimage to, to uh, uh, Israel soon. Uh, but um, uh, we're gonna visit that site. And after that happens, you know, that's when the, 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 the disciples are basically, they're like, Wow, we're going to follow this guy. Well, um, in chapter 6, he goes to a mountain to pray. And after, it says he spent the, the, the night in prayer to God. This is in uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 12. This isn't a part of our passage, but it's just before it. He came down. Uh, uh, he, uh, he, he, uh, when day came, it says he chose... He called his disciples and chose 12 of them, whom he also appointed apostles. And that's when um, it lists the 12 apostles. Then in verse 17, which is our, where our passage starts today in chapter 6, is where he starts this. He came down with them and stood on a level place. Sometimes it's called a plain. That's why we call this the Sermon on the Plain, what he says after it with a great crowd of his disciples, okay? Notice there's this distinction between disciples and apostles, okay? He called his disciples and chose 12 and he named them as apostles. So amongst, in the, in the economy of Luke, the disciples of Jesus are a bigger picture than just the 12 apostles, okay? Verse 17, he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Now, basically, um, he's got an audience of very, um, you know, the, the disciples is the friendly audience and the rest are, you know, inquirers, this be interesting. Let's see what he's got to say. And Tyre and Sidon, that's like, those are like coastal cities, which are not all that Jewish either. Uh, so um, he, his, his P appeal was grand, okay? They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. Um, we've had narratives of this where Jesus has been doing stuff like this, but um, this is um, um, uh, a summary statement, if you will, of how uh, that has been going. Verse 19, and all in the crowd were trying to touch him for power came out from him and healed all of them. So this is Luke's way of casting Jesus as this, uh, this magnetic presence that not only drew people in, but there was power in him that was going out. So, the, so we got both the, the magnetism of drawing people in 
and 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 the the power to heal that that's that's exuding forth. So you can uh, you get that picture of the of, of the, the yeah <laughs> that they're bringing in and putting out. Okay, all of it <clears throat> is constant, and um, if you will. A, 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 evenly distributed, okay? The idea here is that just as much as he draws them in, that he gives back, okay? Verse 20 and following. Then he looked up at his disciples and said. Now, I don't know if he's just talking to the disciples. Um, uh, it, it, remember it said that he had this great multitude of people come. They had come to hear and be healed of their diseases. Maybe they had gone. And it's like, okay, well, we don't even care what this guy's gonna see. We got what we want. I don't know. Um, but look at this, what he says. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on the account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. Wow. <clears throat> so just four uh, blessings. He's going to follow it up with four woes, but... I don't want us to get confused here with the Beatitudes as we have them in Matthew. And Matthew has, in Matthew, there's, I don't know, seven, eight, nine Beatitudes, something like that, and there's no woes. Uh, but here, um, and in Matthew, they're like, blessed are the poor, for theirs, blessed are the meek. Here's, blessed are you, okay? A different uh, take on it, right? He's not on a mountain. This isn't the Sermon on the Mount. This is the Sermon on the Plain, right? Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who hunger. Blessed are you who weep. Blessed are you when people hate you. Okay, there is a motif in the Gospel of Luke of a reversal of fortune. We already had it in the Magnificat in chapters one and two, you know, that beginning where uh, Mary uh, and Elizabeth and the pregnancies and all that, and they're uh, exclaiming the wonderfulness of what God was about to do. They already gave us the blueprint for this. So we shouldn't be surprised that we're hearing this. Luke does have an emphasis on uh, the poor more than you'll find in other gospels. Also, um, any of the disenfranchised, the people at the edges in Luke, they get pulled in much more so. So when he says, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So it's like um, the, the kingdom of God is considered the influence of God, the realm of God, the, the, the place where God, you, you can experience God the most. Well, that's what he means. The best are you who are poor. That's an opening for experiencing God. Not the way we would think of it, but it is. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. We don't always think of ourselves as uh, blessed when we're hungry, but um, blessed is, is in the eye of the beholder because um, you will be filled. So it's like... Um, uh, it's, it's, not like, it's not like you should feel bad if you're not hungry. It's just that if you are hungry, that's not a bad way to be because it just means that you're going to be filled, okay? There's no, uh, there's not, oh, oh, sucks to be you because you're, no. It's seen as just the beginning of what is the good that is to come. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Same thing. We have a tendency to put emphasis on the negative that's happening to us now, and we don't always get that. Oh, well, because that's happening now, that means that something good is actually happening. 
it's hard for us to see that. It's hard for us to feel that because why? We're so wrapped up in, in the, oh, this is horrible, this is horrible. Oh, blah, blah, blah. well, guess what? Um, it's gonna change. It's gonna change. And that's why you're blessed, even though you don't wanna know it because you'd rather, you just feel so good about how, and then you, then you wanna post it. Then you, then we, oh, I gotta talk about this on social media about how bad things are. Yeah, whatever. Okay, blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, revile you, all of that. Okay, um, there is a blessing to come in, in all of these experiences of life where we feel like, oh, how can things be any worse? Well, guess what? What you're, what you're realizing is the bottom of the barrel. You're realizing, oh, this is that rock bottom. And he's saying, oh, this is why you are blessed for you will, yeah, okay. Now, four blessings are followed up with four woes. But woe to you, verse 24, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Um, I can't remember if that was actually included in the lection for today or not. But you see the, the turn of events, okay? The way we see our circumstances in life is we put way too much stock in that experience of the moment. We put way too much value, we, we give it way too much credence, and then we, we wanna share it with everybody, but yet the bottom line is, it's gonna change. Doesn't matter what's happening in life, if it's the bad or the good, guess what? It's gonna change. So don't ever get so down on things when uh, things aren't going well that you think they can't get better. And when things are great, you know, you're not gonna live there. It's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna shift, okay? It's always gonna shift. And the, 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 the blessing is in getting that. Wisdom is when you can not be too excited or too down. And there's nothing wrong with getting excited, by the way. It's just a matter of knowing it's the idea of, yes, this too shall pass, okay? Doesn't mean that we don't celebrate. It just means that we don't find ourselves so forlorn when things turn. Well, I knew it couldn't last, you know, that kind of a thing. There's no place for that. There's no place for that um, in, in, in living a life of wisdom, okay? And that's the theme for this week. I believe that this all follows in the theme of epiphany in that we who are Christ's own, God's people, God's, you know, you know we, we're, the ones that, we're the ones carrying the banner, okay, uh, in, in the world and, and being uh, what God wants us to be. So guess what? We should be the example, right? Well, in our being that epiphany of God, that manifestation of God, we demonstrate that kind of balance, that kind of uh, wisdom uh, in, in life of not getting too far down or too far up, of not uh, you know, getting, getting the reality of the situation, resting in the wisdom of, of the soul, the, the wisdom of the divine, this is where I seek to be. Um, I've been on this path for quite a while. And um, uh, um, it, uh, the, the biggest frustration I have is getting frustrated with people um, that, that aren't on that path as well. So that's my biggest challenge. And I still have to work at that. I still have to work at that. 
but we can be that manifestation of God, that showing of God, that, 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 that epiphany of God if we can rest in and be these wise people who are like trees planted by the water and not like chaff blowing in the wind. Isn't that a wonderful lesson? Um, that is all I have for this week, uh, for the 13th, uh, uh, February 13th, the uh, sixth Sunday uh, after the Epiphany. Until next time, peace. <laughs>